Hello, everyone. Welcome to the secrets of the aspects in astrology. The aspects in your charts are so important to understand. They will reveal your absolute destiny and are very important when we are timing events. Unfortunately, though, there's been quite a lot of misunderstanding, even what are the aspects, let alone how to apply them. So on this video, we're going to go deep into these secrets and make them really work for you. So if you're new to my channel, don't forget to sub below. And if the video is good for you, give it a thumbs up. Let's go. In your birth chart, you will see that the planets have a relationship to each other. A pattern is formed in the sky on the day you were born. But you have to unravel these aspects to understand the actual conversation going on between them. Yes, there is a narrative going on here and this will be the story of your life. But to unravel the narrative, you must understand what the planet Sagrahas are actually talking about. They are individualistic beings, not these rocks we see floating in space. They just represent them. Here's the deep secret. So we need to understand what karmas they are bringing to us through their individual desire. So without understanding this, aspects become extremely confusing, even completely impossible to understand. And because of this, briefly, I just want to mention Western astrology aspects because some of these techniques, some of you may be thinking of adding to your chart or still using. I just want to show you why it's a huge mistake. There are two big problems here. Firstly, all of the aspects, every type of aspect is applied with no discrimination, no differentiation to every single planet. But in fact, Planets have individual desire, individual motivation, individual effect in your chart. And not all the aspects are going to mean anything at all to some of the planets. Next big problem is that Western astrology applies aspect by degree, regardless of sign and house. Probably because tropical zodiac keeps shifting. And so it's just happened over hundreds of years like this. But aspects are not seen by degree. They are seen by the sign and the house. Let's get to the key principles, everyone. There are two types of aspects operating in your chart simultaneously impacting you. In your D1 chart and your Virgo charts, all of them, these two types of aspects are happening. We have the sight aspects or the actual desire of the planets, which are aspecting not each other, but the individual houses ahead. So every planet has their desire, their dristy, but it is temporary actually, only manifesting mostly in the Mahadasha. Secondly, we have the Rasi or sign aspects. Signs aspect each other and this becomes part of of the permanent architecture of your charts. Let's begin by understanding the Dristi or the site aspect then of the planets. The first point is that planets are aspecting the houses everybody by their site. Certain houses ahead of each planet are aspected. That's the thing. They are aspecting the houses and they are impacting events in those houses. And if any planet should be there, then they are equally aspecting those planets. So they aspect by the house, not directly each other. Second point, not all the aspects by house apply equally strongly to each planet. The sight of the individual planet is very individual individual desire. So some planets strongly impact third house from itself and some planets do aspect third house because by the way all the planets virtually aspect all the houses. That's another secret but some more strongly than others. We're going to go through every planet separately and see how it's happening. And a very important point you should understand is that these karmas of these aspects come out in the Mahadasha. That's when you'll see them. You could even say that it's a temporary factor in your chart, manifesting mainly when the planet awakens in your life in his Mahadasha or his Bukti period. And sometimes also by transit. Let's have an example. Let's say you've got Saturn in the first house of your chart. One of Saturn's strongest aspects, and he has many, but one of his strongest is his third Dristi site aspect. That would therefore be if he's in your ascendant on your third house. So during Mahadasha of Saturn, you would have big issues with your siblings and all of those third house factors, definitely. 
Or when Saturn returns, if he's in your first house to his natal place, he will have a definite dristy on that third house during that Saturn return. Now, before I move on to every individual planet aspect, it's very important to understand what are the aspects in astrology. There are four types of aspect that are influencing every single planet. Any planet can have this, some more than others. First of all, the third and the tenth aspect from any planet is the Upachaya, is where that planet works hard, gets some skills and attempts to get profit in life attempts to really increase materially. Next, the tracone or knowledge aspect from any planet, the fifth house away and the ninth house away, that is where they will try to get knowledge. Now, the fourth house away and the eighth house away from any planet is the aspect of protection security, known as Katurastra. Any planet wants to do this, but some are really good at it and some are not really interested by their desire in this protection. Fourth house away, planet puts a guard. And the eighth house away has intervention. Fourth house, security in home. And the eighth house, trauma happens. So any planet wants to protect, wants to help the eighth house, not destroy it. Why? Because when these difficulties, traumas come, you need intervention, you need protection, you need doctors, you need surgeons, even you might need an astrologer. So any planet is very interested in the fourth and eighth house from itself. But as I say, some planets more than others. And finally, all planets have a desire on the seventh house, the relationship house, the house opposing them. They want to control it by their desire. They want to get something from the seventh house from themselves. Now, you may have noticed that the second house, the 12th, the 6th and the 11th were not included in those dristy aspects. Why? Because the second and 12th are shadow houses. There is no desire going there apart from one planet who does have this sort of aspect, as we will see in a minute. Then the 6th house and the 11th house are not aspected either. Why? Because they are both houses of punishment, you should know. The 6th house is the enemies, difficulties, diseases starting, all sorts of 6th house stuff. We know no planet desires 6th house from itself. It doesn't like it at all. And the 11th house may give gain profit, but it is the end of the planet. Something dies about every planet, 11 houses from himself. It is the Harabava. It is the actual death, not the 8th house, but the 11th house. Again, these are the big secrets only available in the Vedic system. Let's start with the sight aspects of Saturn. Shani Maharaj has a powerful Dristi, which is actually destructive. He was given special power that if his sight should fall on anything or anyone, he will destroy it. It's about the sinful karmas coming back, Papa karmas. So we have to understand this by Saturn's aspect. And he has a 100% aspect on the third and the 10th house from himself. But he will also give you growth there because don't forget, these are Upachaya aspects as well. So don't be so fearful of these Saturn site aspects. At the same time, Saturn can be destructive to the third, 10th from himself. Something dies there. Something goes there. Something is removed. Not literal death, actually, but something is just not working there from the third and the 10th where he sits in your chart. Don't forget, though, full effects will only come in the Mahadasha or Bukti or by Saturn's transit also. And remember that only Saturn has the full Upachaya Dristi of gain. Isn't it strange? Only Shani gives you this because he will make you toil. He will make you work. Therefore, you will get reward. Now, Saturn's opposition house, the opposite sign to where he sits in your chart, he has a Dristi, but it's only 75%. This is important. Now, that's quite a lot. He's going to have some, some impact there. Some loss, Mahadasha wise will be there. Saturn, Mahadasha 7th from himself. And there is some definite tension there. A little bit of destruction happens, but it's not as strong as the 3rd and the 10th house. Now, Saturn only has a 50% or a very weak aspect on the 4th house and the 8th house from himself. Remember that people get scared about 8th house from Saturn. Oh my 
goodness, it's only a 50% aspect there from his own position. Why? Because Saturn has not got a big interest in protecting and security, on guarding the home, on helping you from different crises, because he's here to punish. It is not high on his agenda. And this is why, as I try to point out briefly beginning of the video, say you've got planet here, four away from Saturn. Western astrology, you'd be thinking, oh, a terrible Saturn square is happening here. Actually, from Shani's point of view, it's not a big deal. It's not that important at all. In fact, it's only when planets are 10 houses away here from Saturn, from his point of view, any square is really manifesting strongly. So this information, this differentiation is not available in the Western astrology system, making it very, very difficult to make accurate predictions or get any sense at all from the aspects I found. Another big factor, Saturn is not interested in the trine houses to himself. Saturn's trines, from his point of view, are virtually non-existent. So 25% is only the effect. Saturn doesn't want to give education, children, knowledge. It's not his desire. It's not his purpose. So if you've been seeing Saturn's trines in your chart, in a Western chart, you can see here, now we know why they're not really giving any particular impact at all. Jupiter, however, wants to give you knowledge. His strongest aspect, 100% of the fifth, ninth house, trine aspects. He gives you many blessings, fifth, ninth from himself. He can give you children, education and definite wisdom. In addition, you may have not known that Jupiter has a good 75% Dristi on the third house from himself and the 10th house, the two Upachaya houses, where he can give you prosperity, fortune, most definitely. So when you're in Jupiter Mahadasha Bukti, the third house away from his place in your chart and the 10th house, opportunities, prosperity can awaken from those areas. But strangely, Jupiter is not interested in karma desire so much. Yes, he is husband. He wants to give children, but only 50% interested in relationships, actually. Seventh house from himself. But the weakest aspect are the fourth house away from himself and the eighth house. Protection, security. Jupiter is really not interested in this at all. It is not his desire to actually be bodyguard for yourself. He has left that to somebody else completely. Yes, of course, it's Mars Mangala, the only Graha who has a full 100% Dristi on the 4th, 8th house. The only Graha who will give 100% sight onto the Katurastra, onto the protection, security, 4th and 8th house from himself. So Mars Mahadasha expect fourth house away, big events happen. He definitely opens up security here, gives you some extra protection, fourth from himself and eighth from himself. He can give surgery, intervention, counseling, help, trauma, management. He will do everything to ensure survival. He will fight for you eight houses away from himself, but he will naturally cause some disturbance doing that. That's the other thing. Now, you may not know everyone, but Mars has a very strong trine aspect, fifth house, ninth house. He wants knowledge. What sort of knowledge? Occult knowledge. Mangala rules Scorpio. During his Mahadasha, Mars Mahadasha, I've seen many people start studying astrology occult. He wants the secret knowledge very strongly. However, he only has half desire for the Upachaya houses, third house, tenth house, from himself. He's not interested in growth, prosperity, business, skill, all of this particularly at all. Please note carefully, Mongola's seventh aspect of desire, karma, hardly anything at all. He is not interested in relationships, sex, partnership, even business. None of this interests Mongola. It's a very weak factor, seventh away from Mars. 
Now, the faster moving planets, Venus, Mercury, Moon, Sun, we're going to do them quickly and just show you the main aspects, how they work. Venus has a full Dristi on the seventh from himself. In fact, seventh from Venus in your chart can actually bring spouse into your life. Check planets there. Check Mahadasha of that Lord, especially all the planets being there. Venus also has quite a strong protective aspect on the 4th house from himself and on the 8th house because he wants to keep the home secure, bringing up children, relationships, stability and he wants to get rid of crisis, trauma, sickness because he wants to keep you alive so he can have babies. As I've said many times, Venus's number one agenda isn't really romance, it's creating babies. Now, Venus has a very weak trine aspect, of course, 50%, 5th house, ninth house. You might think baby house, 5th house, pregnancy here, ninth house female chart. Yes, he wants to create the babies, but not particularly educate them. And he has a very weak 3rd aspect, 10th aspect. Venus is about indulgence. It's about enjoying life, not necessarily going to work. Now, Mercury's full aspect, like all the inner planets, is on the seventh house, but not because of relationships. Buddha Mercury is not interested. He's a child, basically, but he is interested in skills and business. So, Mercury, seven from himself, very, very prosperous place for skills money management, everything about marketplace. He can give success there in his Mahadasha. Mercury also has a fairly strong square aspect, fourth aspect from himself and eighth aspect. Why? Because he wants to protect money, security, the home and the investments, savings and even stock market dealing, which is all about the eighth aspect. But please note, from Mercury's point of view, trine aspects are weak, half on, half off. He wants knowledge, but he gets bored easily and he doesn't want to work hard. Mercury's third aspect, tenth aspect, are the definite weakest of all. The moon also gives 100% Dristi 7 from himself. What he gives is he desires security. He feels happy. He feels loved. He feels safe wherever is 7th house from himself. Of course, if Saturn is here, that's going to cut that down. But still, he is attempting to get security from the 7th house to his own position. So Moon wants security in relationships. Moon is society. Moon doesn't really want to be alone. He wants to relate to other people. So the seventh house is from the Moon where you go out into society, most definitely. And therefore, Moon Mahadasha, seventh away, that house brings you security, comfort, food, and sometimes even abundance, seventh away from the Moon. The moon naturally puts a very strong aspect, 75% though, onto the fourth house from himself, domesticity, happiness, the home, and the eighth house. He wants to remove trauma, disease, get comfort and security. But the moon is the mind, mind is fickle. So it's got a half on, half off trine aspects. Moon's trines are weak. Take a note, everybody. He can be interested in the knowledge and then he can get moody about it, switch off. And he has a very weak third aspect and tenth aspect. He doesn't want to work hard. Really, he's happiest at home. The sun, Ravi, he definitely is burning a little bit where he sits in that house in your chart, but his full powerful light, Dristi, is on the seventh house. Seven from the sun, he wants to rule. He wants to have prosperity there. He wants to give you success. He's very controlling of that house. And in his Mahadasha, success, prosperity can often come seventh away from himself. And he will give a fairly strong fourth aspect as well and eighth aspect because he wants to protect security of the home and prosperity. But the sun's trine aspect knowledge is not that strong, 50% only. He doesn't really want to have to learn. He's a king, don't forget. So he can be a bit bored with these educational factors. And sun definitely is a very weak aspect on the third 10th house. Once again, he's the ruler. Working, profit, all of these things, he takes those for granted. He doesn't want to put effort there. 
Rahu, North Node of the Moon, perhaps the strongest aspects of all in some way because he is pure desire. Why we are here to fulfill these desires. I'm just going to show the strongest aspect now because this is what will definitely manifest during Mahadasha. Now, Rahu's desires are never satisfied, don't forget. So 100% Dristi goes to where Ketu is because that's the other half of who he is, Swabanu. He wants to become whole again. He's obsessed with this house opposite to where he is, K2 house. But this house becomes disturbed by this obsessive focus of Rahu. K2 doesn't want to fulfill this desire. In a way he does, but in a way he wants to get out of this material world. It's a confusing factor. So Rahu desires this house, but K2 is not looking there at all at Rahu. It's a very disturbed house, actually, where you have K2, by the way, because you want something, but you're not sure what it is that you want. Rahu is obsessed with this house, but never satisfied with it. Now, what's the second house to Rahu? This is very important. Rahu is going in the reverse direction, retrograde. So he's actually going this way around the chart. So second to himself in the sign order is where he has actually just been, what he has left behind. So something you have wanted a long time, maybe past lives definitely, is indicated by the second house to Rahu. Check it out very, very carefully. And so definitely then Rahu Bukti, Rahu Mahadasha rather, and Rahu Bukti, either of them, you will seem to gain what is second to your natal Rahu. It will seem miraculous. Here it is. I've been I've been trying for ages and now it's just come to me out of the blue or all my desires have been satisfied here. It will seem wonderful to begin with, but then inevitably it will not work out as you have planned because it will be the smoke and illusion of Rahu. And another thing, during Rahu Mahadasha, you'll be tempted by these second house factors. Avoid it completely. Become ethical, above board, definitely. Watch your speech, especially in anything regarding the second house to Rahu in your chart. In addition, Rahu has quite strong trine aspects, the fifth, ninth house from himself, because he wants knowledge. Trine is knowledge. Rahu is all head pure intelligence, pure manipulation and guile. He will use knowledge, wisdom, especially Mahadasha. He will get lots of it, but he will manipulate it. That's the thing. Now, just as Rahu is the beginning of all desire, K2 is the end of it. So if he has no desire, how can he have desire, dristy, sight aspect? Because sight aspect is about desire. I've just shown you that. The other thing is, of course, he has no head. He has no eyes. How can he see? I prefer to actually not include sight aspects K2 now. More and more I am seeing they are not showing you so much at all. But some astrologers insist, well, K2 may have intuition, something internal, something that is reaching out to that fifth, ninth house. Check it out for yourself, but I really think you're not going to see that manifest Mahadasha. But K2 does get himself involved in Rasi aspect as we shall see in a minute. Let's bring these aspects together, everybody. Very, very briefly, no in-depth analysis, the chart of the Queen Consort of France, Marie Antoinette. Now, as I say, no exhaustive analysis here. Marie Antoinette died aged 37 during the beginning of Saturn Mahadasha. She was executed, guillotined by the revolutionary French party during the French Revolution. Actually, though, she had just turned 38 when she died. She died on the 16th of October, 1793. Now, she only lived through Mars, Rahu, Jupiter and the beginning of Saturn Mahadasha. But let's use them all to actually illustrate power of the Dristi aspects, everyone. This powerful Mongol rising then for three years was her Mahadasha from birth un until she was three. The thing that happened was very Martian indeed. Now, she was a very physically healthy baby. Mongola gives strength there, very often first house. There was a high infant mortality then, of course, 18th century, but she survived definitely. But between zero to three, 
at two years of age, Mongola impacted her. She got fever. She got smallpox. Very much Mars is about these events. As I've shown you, Mongola has two very strong aspects about protection. Fourth house, eighth house. Protection and security. Now, what also helps is that Mars has a forced risky aspect onto Jupiter as well. Jupiter is here. Guru preserves life. Next thing is that Mars, Jupiter have a permanent Rasi aspect as well, as I will discuss at the end of the video. Mars has an eighth aspect, as I've just shown you, protection. And it is protecting this very strong Shani here. Shani eighth house can very often give longevity, but there are other definite factors showing that she will not have that. I am not going to discuss that here, but definitely they can be seen. Those of you who know about that, you will see it in this D1 immediately. But certainly Mars will protect onto this Saturn in his own sign. Now, Saturn is in a Vipreet Raj Yoga. People think this is powerful. It is. And to begin with, Mars, Saturn aspect here. It was protective. Mars protected her from harm in this dangerous smallpox fever. But eventually, Saturn Mahadasha comes and the Vipreet Raj Yoga fell apart. I've spoken about this danger in these Dustana Yogas. Check the video on my channel, Sixth Lord in All Houses. Now, later on in her childhood, smallpox disease came again to that court of Austria. Sister got it seriously sick, completely disfigured. People died around her, but Marie Antoinette had been protected by Mongola. She was untouched again by the disease. Next, Rahu Mahadasha, between ages 3 and 21. She was engaged to be married and married during that Rahu Mahadasha to the heir to the throne of France. Now, Marie Antoinette was a Duchess of Austria. She was a very high status person, but this was the absolute topmost. This was a very illustrious match. Rahu giving everything from his strong position from the third house of her chart. Of course, she was a child, only 12 when the engagement happened. She had no control of it, but let's look at the aspects to see how it's happening. Rahu's Dristi is second house, fifth house, and ninth house, mostly. So the second house, mother arranged everything for marriage. And Rahu aspects directly Guru Jupiter, second house from himself. Jupiter is the lord of the seventh house, Sagittarius, marriage. And of course, represents the husband. And of course, very, very basically, Rahu aspects the seventh house itself, marriage, and eleventh house, house of gain. She had both. But Rahu gives smoke an illusion always. He's definitely giving it to the second house from himself, 100%. I've just shown you. On to Lord of Marriage House. All Marie Antoinette saw of him before the day she actually married him was a portrait. Unfortunately, though, when she met Louis, he was nothing like that portrait. He was overweight. He was a bit boring. He wasn't intelligent. He was not good looking. And definitely he was a bit slow. Maybe had some learning difficulties. Poor old Louis. But definitely it was a big letdown. Most lightly smoke and illusion coming to the second house from Rahu during the Mahadasha. Now, another interesting factor, Jupiter isn't just Karika husband, it is children as well. And this full 100% second drishti of Rahu really affected her ability to conceive. During the first seven years of Marie Antoinette's marriage, during Rahu Mahadasha totally, she could not conceive a child. What was happening was that Louis did not know what he had to do to make her pregnant, but she got all the blame. But nevertheless, as soon as Marie Antoinette got into Jupiter Mahadasha, she did conceive a child. What happened? Well, basically, someone took the time to take Louis aside and tell him what he had to do. So she got pregnant, basically. But what an example. Rahu, for seven years, completely blocking conception on this second house, Dristi to himself. He gave such a marriage to her, but it was all disillusion. It didn't work out as expected. 
next to Jupiter Mahadasha, which occurred between the ages of 21 and 37. 1777 to 1793, Jupiter in the house of home country. This was actually when the French Revolution took hold. Now, Jupiter is strong, fourth house, and she definitely had many indulgences, luxuries, enjoyments, pleasures even, during this Mahadasha, at least to begin with. Now, Jupiter's fourth house, but also in Virgo. Not a strong placement, but Virgo is countryside. During this time, she had created for herself the the Petite Trignon, that little country house in the grounds of Versailles, where she would play at being like a milkmaid, even with cows, sheep and animals there, just like a miniature farm, actually. But this was not uncommon. Many aristocratic ladies had these sort of indulgences. It was simply a fashion at the time. But for Marie Antoinette, this Jupiter is a functional malefic because she has Gemini rising. It's a functional malefic Mahadasha. And so all of these luxuries, enjoyments, pursuits, whatever, became dangerous for her. Furthermore, because Jupiter is trapped in a papa cartery between two malefics, Rahu and the sun. Of course, Rahu and the sun are an eclipsing factor. So everything about her life, everything about her existence, home life, country, everything was completely eclipsed because the French Revolution came and destroyed everything. And Jupiter's full Dristi aspects, fifth aspect is the eighth house. Trauma, change, difficulty, complete transformation, you could say. And the twelfth house, loss and imprisonment. Both happened in this Mahadasha. Jupiter also always has a very strong third Dristi. I've just spoken about that to the third house from himself, where we see Mercury, Lord of the chart, in this very difficult position, Scorpio, sixth house. This Mercury is herself, of course, Lagna Lord. She is trapped in the hands of her enemies for the whole of this Mahadasha. This Scorpio Mercury was blamed for everything. She was trapped in a political situation, not of her own making. So this Mercury, although it's strong, sixth house generally, in Scorpio, in the Mars sign, and there is part of Artanan here, Mars Mercury, I know, but basically she is getting scapegoated for every ill affecting her country, fourth house. She becomes to blame and eventually extremely hated. In fact, in the Jupiter-Mercury period, that was when her definite unpopularity grew. It became greater, greater than so many different intrigues happened. And she was blamed, as I say, for every ill affecting France at the time. But the full reign of terror of the French Revolution began with the storming of the Bastille. That occurred in her Jupiter-Moon period. And you can see that Moon is co-lord of the 12th house, having full aspect of this Jupiter here. So prisons, 12th house, revolution definitely happening in this Jupiter Moon period. Second to this Jupiter, never a good placement. But the definite time when everything fell apart was the Jupiter Rahu, bringing this Rahu eclipsing factor onto Jupiter. In Jupiter, Rahu, Rahu is 12th, of course, husband was executed and she was imprisoned together with her children. After that, she entered Shani Mahadasha. Note Shani's powerful Dristi. In the Shani Shani period, Saturn was aspecting full on the third house away, 10th house of career, status, prominence, everything about who she was name was taken away. She was deposed. She was no longer the queen. She was simply Madame Capet. And Saturn's 10th house, Dristi, completely destroying 5th house. Children here, they were actually taken away from her. And even worse than that, in a way, her son, her third son, surviving son, was made to actually give evidence against her. He was forced to say that she had abused him, even sexually abused him. All of this false propaganda, obviously, but it was done so that she would be completely discredited, ready for the execution. 
Next, the key principles of the Rasi or the sign aspect. Signs, aspect, signs, as I've just pointed out earlier on. And these are permanent factors in your chart, permanent aspects in your life. Because of this, in Vedic astrology, we see these sign aspects as being permanent karmas coming back, really unavoidable factors that we have to face. It's a bit like structures here, houses, who are permanently aspecting, seeing what is permanently ahead of them, present. Now, it's not a perfect analogy because houses fall down. We know that, but you will surely get the idea. This is a permanent structural factor in your chart that will always impact. Now, to see Rossi aspects between signs, we have to group them into three natural groups, which they actually fall into. Aries, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn, shown here, are the movable or the cardinal signs. These signs are very restless, always doing something, and they are complemented by the fixed signs. Therefore, there is aspect between them. Let's see. The four fixed signs are Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, Aquarius, and these signs are stubborn signs. If they don't want to move a lot, they want to stick with things, they can be a bit stuck in the mud. So they benefit from the energy coming from these cardinal signs. And of course, cardinal signs, movable signs, get benefit from the fixed signs, which stabilize their nature. It's fairly simple. The cardinal signs aspect fixed signs, fixed signs, cardinal signs, except there is one exception. They don't aspect the sign next door. So Aries, Taurus never aspect each other. Cancer, Leo never aspect. Libra, Scorpio, Capricorn, Aquarius, these signs do not aspect each other. And finally, we have the four mutable signs, dual signs, Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, Pisces. They aspect each other with no exceptions at all. A table for you, everybody, making it quite simple. I hope you could even screenshot this if you'd like to. Cardinal signs here, fixed signs here, aspect each other, except the one next door. So Aries, never Taurus, Taurus, never Aries, Cancer, never Leo, Leo, never Cancer, etc. And dual signs shown here, aspect each other. Back to Marie Antoinette's chart to see the permanent Rassi Dristi, very karmic permanent aspects in her chart. First of all, Mars, Jupiter have a mutable sign permanent Rassi aspect. Gemini permanently aspecting Virgo. Don't forget these four mutable signs, Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, Pisces aspect each other. So it isn't just self-home, it's self-home relationship and status having some Kendra factor here. So check out mutable dual signs. Those four signs in your chart are karmically connected by circumstance. Here, of course, we also see Mars in this rising sign, Gemini, connected to Jupiter, fourth house, mother. Her whole destiny came came about, her whole circumstance, tragic end, came about because of her marriage, seventh Lord Jupiter, which was arranged by the mother. It's in the fourth house. Of course, Mars is the sixth house Lord enemy sign. So the enemies have come onto her head and there is a definite part of Vartana, and I'm, sh I'm sure you've seen it between Mercury and Mars exchanging signs. So this violence and these enemies coming from this sixth house here onto her head are coming from the, the definite permanent connection to Guru. Guru is Lord of the seventh house husband and he's in the fourth house, home, country, husband's country, husband's status, ten away here, king. These are permanently linked karmas sealing her fate. Another permanent Rasi aspect is between fifth house, Libra, and the ninth house, fixed sign, Aquarius. Could spend a whole video looking at the impact of this ninth house, fifth house, Rassi Dristi here. It's very potent, but I won't do, don't worry. K2 is the lord of the sixth house, everybody. The enemies who were actually virtually terrorists because K2 represents terrorism. And the French Revolution was actually called the terror. So K2 represents enemies, terror, French Revolution, who took away from her children fifth house permanent factor here and she had three children at the time. 
But more to the point, the other revolutionary sign is Aquarius, where Rahu also has a fixed aspect onto this fifth house children from Leo onto the cardinal sign of Libra. And perhaps the most potent tragic of all of these Rassi Dristis, Mercury Lord herself, Lord of the chart, is in the hands of her enemies, as I have previously explained in this terrible sixth house Scorpio situation where Mercury is having a permanent aspect onto Saturn in the graveyard sign in the eighth house. These two Dustana houses are just creating complete disturbance scapegoating and ultimately her death which as i've just shown you occurred in saturn saturn mahadasha check out the other big secrets in astrology playlist on your screen right now if you're new to my channel don't forget to sub below goodbye for now god bless you all